The mysterious tree appeared to sprout from the forest edge overnight. It seemed harmless enough, that is, until the black fruit started to fall from its twisted branches. Welcome to Monster of the Week! Today we are talking about a creature that not only hides within the trees, but is itself a tree. We are of course talking about the Orc Wart. The Orc Wart made its one and only appearance in 3rd edition's Monster Manual 2. We're going to cover what it is, how and why it fights, some changes you could use to make this awesome creature even better, and of course some plot hooks for you to use in your game. So, what exactly is the Orc Wart? Well, it's a gigantic tree. A gigantic bloodthirsty tree. It wanders through the night until it finds a suitable spot, ideally on the edge of a small town or a village. Once a spot is found, it digs its roots into the ground and appears simply as a massive tree that may have just sprung up overnight. Why you ask? Well, over the course of about a week, the tree produces 5 to 20 black pods that hang from its branches. These pods appear as lumpy, misshapen pieces of fruit that once big enough and fully mature, fall from the tree, and then they crack open. From each pod emerges a mobile plant creature called a wartling. Now these wartlings are very similar to orcs in appearance, except they're much smaller and they're made entirely out of wood. The parent plant then sends out these wartlings in hunting parties to find warm-blooded creatures for consumption. Which brings us back, of course, to why the tree settles near small towns and villages. When a wartling returns from the hunt with any live creature, massive vines reach down from the orc wart tree and grab the creature to pull it into its gigantic maw. Livestock and humanoids make up the bulk of the tree's diet, however, the tree isn't really picky and it will ultimately consume anything that has a pulse. The orc wart is even capable of decimating a village in just a single night. If left unchecked, it will strip an area completely of its prey and then move on to another suitable location. So I'm sure you're wondering, what are these things capable of in combat? And this is actually where we run into our first major problem. The Wartlings are CR 3. I mean, they're definitely able combatants, but with a CR like that, you'd expect the parent tree to be maybe CR 6 to 8 at most. After all, the Wartlings are just mooks belonging to the tree, so it makes sense that the tree would be a little bit higher on the challenge rating scale. The book actually has the tree statted out as a CR 20 monster. That is insane! That doesn't make any sense to me, I really don't know why they did that. Because any party that you would put the wartlings up against as a reasonable challenge is going to get absolutely destroyed by a tree that's that powerful. And on the flip side of that, if you're planning a CR20 encounter for a high level party, the CR3 monsters are going to be a total joke, they're going to present no challenge and basically just serve as an annoyance while they're trying to take down the tree. The main issue here is that there's a huge disparity between the tree's challenge rating and that of the wartlings. So, for a higher level party, you could consider beefing up the minions a bit so that they actually present a challenge to the party, and for a lower level game, you could consider kind of dumbing down the stats on the tree a bit so it still provides a challenging encounter, but it doesn't just outright kill the entire party in one turn. This is easier said than done, of course, but don't worry, I got your back. In the description below, I've made sure to include in my stat block a higher level wartling and a much lower level orc wart tree that I feel is appropriate. At least it should serve as a starting point anyways for kind of dumbing down the encounter a bit for what I think anyways is a suitable level. This all said though, I think there is a third option that could potentially work well as long as you set it up properly. See, if we simply leave the tree and wartling stats as they are in the book, this kind of creates a really interesting problem. The party may be able to fend off wave after wave of wartling invasions, but how do they deal with the tree? That's not necessarily a bad question to make your players ask. At this point, the tree is more of a natural hazard than anything else. They simply can't fight it in single combat, that's just not gonna work. So what do they do? They could try burning down that part of the forest and the orc war tree with it, or maybe they could use some kind of siege weapon against it. But I mean, if they do try to burn down the forest, then maybe the orc wart tree, who's not going to just sit there and burn to death, starts coming towards the town. It can only move 10 feet per round, it's not very fast. I mean, I guess it's fast considering it's a tree, but it's not the fastest creature in the monster manual. But, if it starts coming towards town, that now puts a clock on your players. They have a certain amount of time to figure out how to deal with this, otherwise that town is toast. Ultimately, I think this could be really interesting, but you just have to make sure the players know going into it how dangerous the tree really is. 
There's nothing worse than having an encounter design for your players where they think just because you're making them fight it, it's appropriately CR'd, and then having one of your players just outright die, or in this case, it could end up being two or three. The other thing I think that's kind of cool about this is because the stakes are real, they may not actually figure out a way to deal with this, and if they don't, that village is going to get absolutely just destroyed. That could make for a really interesting adventure though, one where this tree is just kind of roaming through the world obliterating everything in its path, and the players have to find a way to stop it before it gets to the next village, or the one after that, or the one after that, and the longer they take, the more innocent people are going to die. So I don't know, maybe that's a good idea, maybe it isn't, I haven't actually tried that personally, so that is just kind of me thinking, but the more I say it out loud, the more I kind of want the big bad in my next campaign to be a giant evil tree, that just sounds hilarious. Anyways, let's talk about what this monster can actually do in combat. I'll start off by talking about the Wardlings, because that's what your players will primarily be engaging with. The Wardlings are small in size, they have a move speed of 30, a climb speed of 15, and they use very simple tactics. They seek to overwhelm, subdue, and come back to the tree with any living food they can bring. They prefer to gang up on foes, thus maximizing their chance for a meal. If they can knock someone out or subdue a creature, they will then take that creature and bring them back to the tree while the others remain behind to finish the battle. In order to subdue a target, however, they don't have to drop that target to zero HP. Their claws secrete a poison that when they strike an opponent, there's a chance that it will put that opponent to sleep. Any creature subject to a melee attack from one of the wartlings has to make a constitution save. If they fail, they're knocked out for one minute. After that minute, they get another constitution save. If they fail that too, then they're put to sleep for 1d10 minutes. After which, of course, the effect wears off. Another thing that might catch your players off guard is how nimble these creatures actually are. They're so nimble, in fact, that up to three of them can occupy the same five foot square. This can be really useful for trying to take down a foe that's cornered itself, however it does make them more susceptible to certain area of effect spells. However, this is a small price for them to pay, because most of their usual prey doesn't know how to cast Fireball. The last thing I wanted to talk about regarding the Wartlings is their method of communication. They are essentially a hive mind linked to the Orc Wart tree. All Wartlings within 15 miles are all in constant communication with each other, meaning that any meaning that any wartling can perceive anything another wartling can perceive, or that the tree itself can perceive. Because of this, wartlings can never be flanked, unless of course every wartling in the combat is flanked. So if you use flanking rules, that's a good thing to keep in mind, because it's going to maybe confuse your players a little bit when they have one of them surrounded and they don't get advantage on their attacks. And speaking of perception, since these little guys don't have eyes, they have to use something called wood sense. This uncanny ability allows them and the orc wart tree itself to effectively see anything that is within 60 feet of one of them and in contact with some kind of vegetation. It's for this reason that they'll typically avoid large developed cities, and also for this reason that small villages and towns that still have an abundance of grass and plant life everywhere are prime targets. If your players discover this limitation, they could definitely try to exploit it by burning off swathes of vegetation around the village they're trying to protect, however the peasants might not be too keen on them burning off their crops. So now that you know what the minions can do, let's talk about the tree itself. The first thing worth mentioning is that the tree will immediately recall any wartlings it has previously sent out if it becomes under attack. The second thing worth mentioning is that it can effectively cast Entangle as a free action, and it can't be dispelled, because it's not casting the spell. It's literally using its roots to bind any players or creatures within 15 feet of itself. This makes approaching the tree to strike it with a melee weapon or natural attack very difficult or even impossible in some cases. This is made much worse by the fact that the tree gets 6 slam attacks, and every time it connects, it gets to make a grapple check on whoever it's fighting. If the tree does manage to grab onto someone, on its next turn, if it's still holding them, it can then attempt to swallow that creature by making another grapple check. Any creature swallowed by the tree has to succeed on one of those constitution saves, otherwise they're going to be paralyzed by the tree's digestive juices. Assuming the swallowed creature makes its constitution save, it then has two options. It can try to climb its way back out with a few difficult athletics checks, or it can cut its way out by making attacks against the inside of the tree. If it manages to cut a hole large enough for it to escape, it can then get out of the tree, however that hole does seal up immediately after they leave, thus to prevent any other creatures from escaping the tree. I feel like most of this is going to remain consistent if you downgrade the power level of the tree, 
However, the only things that really will change are going to be the hit points of the tree and of course how much damage each of its attacks do. Now, we've already talked about some of the ways you could use the Orc Wart tree in your game, but let's elaborate on that a little bit more. Setting up an adventure like we previously spoke about wouldn't be too difficult. All you'd really have to do is feed your players some rumors about people going missing near the edge of town, or odd little creatures spotted near the tree line. If you want to be even more direct, you could have the players catch wind of a giant tree that seemingly just sprouted up from the ground overnight. Upon investigation of this tree, they might find the weird black fruit hanging from its branches. If they try to destroy the tree, this could turn into a deadly encounter pretty quick though. I would be careful not to kill off any of the players right here since this is kind of just them getting into this adventure, but if they keep pressing the attack against the tree, this very well could just turn into the boss fight right away. If you're going with the story route that involves the extremely overstated tree from the book, I would be very clear to explain to your players that this tree is massive. It's literally typed as colossal in the 3rd edition book, meaning that it's over 60 feet tall, which is just crazy to me. If you describe it as being that big, hopefully your players will have an idea that they should not be trying to stab this thing to death at 5th level. Another bit of flavor we haven't talked about is how these trees pollinate, so to speak. Apparently the wartlings live for less than a week, 1d4 plus 1 days according to the book. If any wartlings are still alive after the tree is ready to move on, it then sends them out to the edges of its 15 mile telepathy. There, the wartlings dig into the ground and start spreading out their roots, and if they're not disturbed or destroyed for one year, they will turn into a new orc wart tree. Planting a bunch of these things all over the land kind of sounds like something a twisted evil druid might do, don't you think? On that topic, if you happen to be running an adventure like the Sunless Citadel for example, if the druid gets away at the end of that story arc, maybe that's what he goes on to do. All in all, I think these monsters are great, and they're so extremely obscure, I highly doubt any of your players will have any idea what to expect. If you do plan on using the Orc Wart tree in one of your games, or at least some version of it, or maybe even if a DM has used this on you in the past, please let me know in the comments below, I would actually love to hear about it. I hope you found this video helpful, and if you enjoyed listening to me talk about murderous fruit bearing trees, then please subscribe. I have at least one new video every week, and as always, if you have any suggestions for types of monsters you'd like to see, please leave a comment and I'll see what I can dig up. I also want to say thank you to everyone who participated in the Twitter giveaway this week. There was some really awesome feedback and some great comments on there, and I really appreciate all the support from you guys. If you took part in that, thank you so much, and a big congratulations to Jordan White, who is our winner, who chose to go with the Tome of Beasts as his prize. To everyone else, don't worry, if you didn't win this time, I'm sure we'll do more of these in the future, but I'll have to figure that out once I get back from vacation. Which brings me to my next topic, by the time this video hits YouTube, I will be on vacation. I don't think I'll be able to get to the comments too much on YouTube while I'm away, so if you see a bunch of people leaving comments and I'm not responding to anybody, that's why. I look forward to seeing what you all have to say when I return. As for next week's video, I was able to push to get that done this week, so don't worry, that one will still be out on time, I just won't be around to talk about it. Anyways, thank you all so much for watching, I really appreciate it, and I will see you next time.